Have you ever wondered who the guy was running through the olive trees stark naked? It was a cold night because when uh, Jesus was taken to the house of Caiaphas, they had a, a fire burning and Peter stood by it to get warm. So it was a cold night. So not a night to be out streaking. No, it wasn't. So who was this guy running stark naked through the olive trees? Well, we're told a little bit about him. We're told him he was a young man there in verse 51, a young man, and he was following Jesus. So he wasn't part of the arresting party. He was part of the uh, group of followers uh, to Jesus Christ. We're not told who he was. We're not told who he was for various reasons. One, it doesn't really matter. Secondly, he was just an example of all the others. They all fled. They all fled away. But thirdly, we have very good reasons for suspecting that the young man who ran away naked was actually the guy who wrote this gospel, Mark. And that's why he didn't mention his name, because it's the kind of thing you don't boast about. And um, the story goes a bit like this. It was in Mark's house. He's known as John Mark. Sometimes he's called John, sometimes he's called Mark. It's very confusing, and I sometimes call him John Mark, just to be on the safe side. He was a young guy, and it was in his parents' house that there was the upper room that the early church met in. So it's very uh, easy to suppose that it was in his house in the upper room where Jesus met with his disciples to have their uh, last supper together. Jesus was with his disciples. Judas left to go and betray Jesus and get the soldiers to bring them back to Mark's house. But when Judas comes back with the soldiers, rap on the door of Mark's house, Jesus and his disciples have already left. They've already gone to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. So when that happens on the door, Mark, who's in bed, sits up, wonders what's happening, looks out of the window, sees a posse of soldiers with Judas, asking, where's Jesus? Well, they walk off to the, march off to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where Judas now suspects Jesus to be, because he knows Jesus went there to pray. And Mark's sitting in bed, wondering, what should he do? Heart thumping? He's got his blanket around him. Actually, it wasn't a woolen blanket. We're told it was a linen cloth. It was the one who uh, came from India, the word tells us. And um, it, it was a nice thing that would keep him warm in bed on a cold night. And he was there, sitting in bed, wrapping his garment around him, wondering what he should do. And he said, I've got to warn Jesus. So he jumps out, out the window with his sheet around him and runs a different route to the Garden of Gethsemane so that he can warn Jesus that the soldiers are coming to arrest him. But because he's taken the other route, the soldiers get there first. Judas is betraying Jesus. There's a kerfuffle. And in the kerfuffle, uh, John Mark gets grabbed by a soldier. But fortunately, he isn't wearing a normal garment, which has, you know, sleeves, which he could be held by, but it's just a sheet. So the soldier grabs the sheet, and John Mark lets go. <laughs> and he runs as fast as he can, and being naked, on a cold night, he manages to run really, really fast, wee, 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 all the way home, to explain to his mum what happened to his sheet. It is interesting that church history has recorded John Mark as being stump-fingered. And the possibility is that in the fracas, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter was wielding his sword and others, that John Mark lost more than his blanket, but he lost his finger. Well, we're not sure, but that is the best suggestion we can give as to who the young man was in the garden who ran away naked. But the important thing to notice is that they all fled. They all ran away. And here we have three stories. We have the story of 
uh, Judas, we have the story of Peter, and we have the story of the young man, Mark. And they all ran away, but they all did so for different reasons. And that's what's so interesting. Because the reason that you will be tempted to run away from Jesus Christ will be very, very different from a person on the other side of the church will face. And we will have different battles. And some people, like Judas, may be tempted by money. And the thing, if we're going to get blown out of the water by Satan, it's going to be because of our love of money. For other people, like Peter, it might be our pride and our self-sufficiency and our self-importance that will destroy us. For others, it might be like John Mark, it might be our cowardice, our fear that will, that will destroy us. That if the devil can get in, that's the way he's going to get into our lives. For some people, it might be our family, which is more important to us than God. For others, it might be our job, it might be our hobbies. For some people, it might be what's on the telly. For others, it might be what's on the internet. For some people, it's the pride of life. For some people, it's the lust of the eyes. For some people, it's the lust of the flesh. And the devil tempts us in different ways. And we've got to guard our hearts because the devil knows where to get us. He knows our besetting sin. He knows our weakness. And the fact that we don't fall like other people shouldn't make us, oh, I'm better than them. We must be on our guard. If a man thinks he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. They all fell. And they fell in different ways. Notice, first of all, in verses 43 to 46, that Judas, Judas Iscariot, turned against Jesus. Judas, one of the twelve, a great name, named after the tribe of Judah, from which tribe the King David came. Judah, or Judas, courageous man, probably Iscariot means a, um, a person who would hold a, a short sword, a dagger. He, he wasn't a fellow to mess around with. He was one of the twelve. He called Jesus rabbi. He uh, respected Jesus as the teacher. And indeed, he kissed Jesus. He showed uh, affection, at least a show of affection to Jesus. So on the outside... Judas looked just as good as it was possible to be. He was one of the chosen twelve. He was the one who called Jesus rabbi. He was the one who kissed Jesus. But there was hatred in his heart. There was that hypocrisy, wasn't there? There was what he did on the outside, which was totally different from what he was like on the inside. And tonight, as we celebrate the carol service, we will hear the reading about King Herod. Who said to the wise man, oh, go and see the babe and come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him. What he meant was so that I can go and murder him. But what he said on the outside was completely the opposite from what was on the inside. When Judas kissed Jesus, that was completely the opposite from what was in his heart. He had a superficial smattering of the right religion. And that made him very, very dangerous disciple. When I left school, I went over to work in the English hospital in Nazareth in Israel for a year. And the English hospital in Nazareth was a teaching hospital for nurses. So it not only had lots and lots of pretty nurses, but it had lots and lots and lots of training nurses as well. And there was me, 18-year-old single lad, surrounded by hundreds of very, very pretty nurses. It was very, very nice, just in case you wondered. Um, work had never been so nice. No, one of the older sisters, her dad was chaplain at London Bible College, actually, and she would keep saying to me, she said, Chris, remember that beauty is only skin deep. I said, well, it's deep enough for me. <laughs> but she said, no, it's only skin deep. Well, you know, some people have Christianity that is only skin deep. Judas was a disciple, but his discipleship was only skin deep. And that is not deep enough. There are people who pretend to believe. I can tell you about Patricia. This guy fell in love with her. He started coming to church with her. 
pretended to be a Christian. They got married. He's never darkened the door of a church since. He just pretended to be a Christian to win the girl. I can take you around churches this morning, this evening, where there will be people who are, are local councillors or, or whatever who go there because, well, it, it looks good in the eyes of the people. You know, have a bit of Christianity. People will vote for you. They will respect you. It's just superficial. It's just hypocritical. It's not good enough. There are people who've gone along with it. Their parents believed it. And they've just accepted what their parents taught them. You know, their parents taught them to pray and they keep praying. Their parents took them to church and they keep going to church. Their parents taught them to say grace before meal. They say grace before meals. And it's just superficial. It's just on the outside. There are those who've been baptized. Their friends made professions of faith. They just went along with it. They were baptized with their friends and everything else. It's just superficial. It's not deep. It's not genuine. Remember the story Jesus told about the seed that fell on shallow soil? And it received the word with joy. It had a kind of conversion experience. And it grew up rapidly. It seemed to be wonderful. But it withered. Why? Because it had no root. There was no depth. It was all superficial. It was all skin deep. And Jesus had one disciple whose discipleship was just skin deep. And he ended up trying to destroy Jesus. The Apostle Peter tells us in his letter that we've got to make sure that our faith is genuine. How do we know if our faith is genuine? Because it stands after the testing. So your faith is tested. You're not for sick sometimes. Sometimes you make a mess of things. But you come back in repentance to get right with God again. But Judas failed. Judas had been hearing Jesus, seeing Jesus, with Jesus. And then he turned on Jesus. And just before I move from Judas to Peter, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, there may be people here this morning who are in the Judas camp. Your Christianity is just skin deep. It's of words without deeds. It's knowledge without faith. It's superficial. Well, don't be content with a superficial smattering of Christianity. Because it will not save your soul. And it will not be an encouragement to others. The greatest discouragement in my life is looking back over those who I was in the youth work with. Those who I was at Bible college with. Who have turned their back upon the things of God. Who have turned away from Jesus Christ. Because they just had that superficial commitment. And for a while they seemed to be going on. But it wasn't real. There was no root. We must make sure there is that deep root that we turn from our sin. And we turn to Jesus Christ, that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we live for Jesus Christ, that we exalt Jesus Christ, that he is everything. We say to him, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We must not have a Christianity of convenience or a Christianity that suits us, but we must deny ourselves Take up the cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. As John says in his letter, test yourself. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. How do we know if we're in the faith? Well, there are lots of tests. But basically, we recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has risen from the dead and Jesus Christ is Lord. And therefore, we are trusting in him as our Lord and Savior. Don't be content just with a smattering of Christianity. But before I move on to Peter, I want to talk to those who fear that they are like Judas but aren't. And this is a real danger because 
most of the people who are like Judas don't have any problems. They don't care about it. But there are lots and lots of Christians who have very sensitive consciences. And when I talk about Judas, they say, well, that's me. I remember as a young man being up in the church at Whitby with a group of young people. And another minister I knew there was in the congregation. And the fellow preaching preached about Judas. And this minister came up to me afterwards. He said, I'm Judas. That's me. He was completely devastated and almost destroyed by the sermon because he had a very sensitive conscience. He was aware of his weaknesses and when he, when he heard about Judas failing, he thought, that's me. I'm Judas. I'm an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you fear that you're like Judas, three things. Number one, look up. Remember that hymn when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within? Upwards I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. The reason we are saved is not because we're sinlessly perfect, but because we have a saviour who has dealt with our sin. And we look not to ourselves. If you look in at your heart, you'll think you're Judas. If you look in at your heart, you'll think you're going to be worse than Judas. But look upwards. And look to Jesus Christ and you see, yes, he died for my sin. He saved me. Don't just look up though. Look back. Look back to the cross of Calvary. Don't look at how you are doing in the present. Look back to see what Jesus Christ did for you when he died upon the cross of Calvary. And say the other hymn. You know the hymn Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Why am I saved? Is it because I've got lots that I've done for Jesus Christ? No. I've got nothing in my hand. Nothing. But he's done it all for me. He lives for me. He died for me. Look up. Look back. And then look into the scriptures. You remember the story of the guy who went to see his minister and said, "Ah, I've got real problems, minister. And the minister said, what are they? He said, well, I don't think I'm saved. And the minister said, well, what do you want? He said, well, I want to feel saved. I just want to feel I'm saved. And the minister said to him, well, you know, can you trust your feelings? And the guy thought for a minute. You know, sometimes you feel good, sometimes you feel bad. Sometimes you can feel ill and you're completely well, just got man flu. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can feel ill and you can be really bad. You can't trust your feelings. So if you feel you're saved, doesn't mean you're saved. And the guy said, no, I suppose it's not good enough to have feelings. I know what I want, said the guy. He said, I I want an angel to come and tell me that I'm saved. Then I'll know that I'm saved. If an angel came and told me, then I would know that I'm saved. Would you, said the minister? What happens if it's the devil pretending to be an angel of light. What about those angels who the Apostle Paul warns us about who preach another gospel? You know, what happens if it's an angel who's not telling the truth? That's not good enough, is it? No, said the guy. He said, well, it's not good enough if I feel saved. It's not good enough if I have an angel telling me. Well, what is good enough for me then? So the minister told him, the only thing that's good enough is that God tells you. So that's why we read the Bible. We read things like John chapter 3 and verse 36, which tells us that everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has eternal life. Do you know what John chapter, can you quote John chapter 3 verse 36? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's what God says. You can't trust your feelings, you can't trust an angel, but you can trust God. So how do we know if we're like Judas? Judas. We test ourselves. Do we believe in the Son? Do we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? We look up and see him living for us. We look back and see him dying for us. And we look at his word and see what he says to us. So let's not let an oversensitive conscience be an area where the devil can get in and destroy our assurance. But let's also be warned, some people like Judas, have had a superficial Christianity and then turned against Jesus Christ. But let's move on. Verses 47 to 50 tell us about Peter, 
who fell away in a very different way from Judas. Uh, Peter's falling away wasn't obvious. It was obvious that Judas was a traitor. He had gone and betrayed Jesus Christ to the soldiers. But Peter, well, Peter, he grabbed his sword and he went like a bull in a china shop to beat up all these soldiers single-handed. Um, we're not actually told it was Peter who did this. If you read these verses, it doesn't mention Peter by name at all. The reason was that when Mark wrote his gospel, Peter was still alive. And it was pretty dangerous to suddenly announce that Peter had attacked and tried to kill some of the uh, authorities. And so it had to be put in very uh, hedgy uh, language. One of those standing near drew his sword. It wasn't until 30 years later, after Peter had died, when John wrote his gospel, that he tells us it was Simon Peter who drew his sword and chopped off the ear of uh, the uh, high priest's servant. And um, notice that it says here, then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck not a servant of the high priest, but the servant of the high priest. This was the man who was leading the soldiers to come and arrest Jesus. And Peter went straight for the top man. You can imagine what happened. Peter drew his sword and he went to chop the man's head off. But he ducked and it just took his ear off. It was pretty gruesome what Peter was doing. This was really fearsome stuff. Peter didn't act with half measures. Well, what was wrong with this then? Wasn't this good? Shouldn't we all stand there clapping Peter, saying, come on, Peter, this is really good. If only more people were like you. No, this was Peter falling away. This was Peter making a mess of things completely. How do we know that this was wrong? Well, we just read the next verse. But Jesus says, am I leading a rebellion? Well, look at Peter, and it looks like it, doesn't it? You know, Peter is there with his sword out to fight. And Jesus disassociates himself from that. He says, look, I'm not leading a rebellion. I'm totally separate from all of this. I'm not a terrorist. I'm a teacher. Down through the history, there have been things done like Simon Peter. There have been the Crusades. There's been the Inquisition. There's been Jim Jones and his temple in uh, Guyana. There's been people bombing abortion clinics. And they do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, that's, that's falling away. That's not being a follower of mine. We do not fight God's battles with the weapons of this world. And it's hard for us to understand that. In Chesterfield, we had a fellow converted. He was foreman of a building site, very rough, tough guy. We nicknamed him Bob the Builder. And um, he, he was wonderfully converted. And um, he'd been so near, and he, he'd wanted to take communion. I said, no, no, no. And then he came through, was wonderfully saved. He took communion, and he rushed to me after the service. He said, I've got a plan. We're going to force everything everybody to come to church we're going to force everybody to become christians i said um didn't you hear what i was talking in my sermon about loving people he said yeah i didn't really agree with that bit <laughs> and i said to him i said you mean we should do things like the crusades oh i i hadn't thought about that he said but he was so zealous you know, you would have thought, here, this is, this is someone who's really on fire for Jesus Christ. He was really out of step with Jesus Christ. This was falling away. Um, we hear of people who can pray like angels in prayer meetings, but they can talk like demons in church members' meetings. And, and what they're doing is they're showing their true colors. It's not enough just to be able to be nice on the outside if we have tongues and the swords that will chop people's heads off. How many... People, by using their tongues like a sword, have chopped off people's ears, so now they won't listen to the gospel at all. Because we've not been acting like Jesus Christ, we've been acting quite the opposite of Jesus Christ. I was preaching at an evangelistic rally once, and afterwards I went to sit down in the congregation, and the person I sat next to, 
had a girl with him and he was laying into her that she needed to be saved and he was telling her that she was going to go to hell and it was all the right words but it just seemed to be so wrong and then he kept drawing me in and said Chris you tell her you tell her that she's going to burn in hell for this and that and I thought there's something wrong here because it was all it was seemed to be right but it was all so wrong And I remembered the story that the Puritan told that he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw an open-air service. And he went down to listen to the open-air service. And he saw it was the devil preaching. And he thought, I'm going to learn the latest heresy. So he went and he listened, and, and the devil preached the gospel. He preached everything about Jesus Christ dying for us and rising again. And so afterwards, the Puritan went and asked the devil why he preached the truth. And the devil said because he had discovered that the surest way to get people to reject the gospel is to give them the gospel without the love of Christ in it. Wield the sword. But why did Peter behave like this? Well, maybe it was pride, he didn't want to look bad. Maybe it was guilt. Maybe he felt guilty that he had been sleeping in the garden and now he was going to make up for it. How many people make themselves fanatical because instead of repenting of their sin, they try to make up for it. I was at a meeting, an inter-church meeting, an FIEC rally. Lots of different ministers were there and we had a meeting of ministers and their wives to plan things. And there was one lady I'd never met there before, but she and her husband, the ministers about 10 miles away, were telling us that we should have more meetings and we should be doing that and we should be doing the other. And we all felt so challenged by this commitment this zeal we looked at our diaries and wondered how on earth we could do it and and then our husband said that maybe this was a bit too much and she laid into him so we all felt sorry for ourselves but we felt more sorry for him and then on monday the local newspaper came out with her picture in it on that saturday when she had come to that meeting the day before she had been in court And she'd been fined for attacking someone in a car park who had taken a car parking space that she thought was hers. And she had come from court, and instead of repenting and asking for mercy, she was going to be super zealous and fanatical. Maybe Peter was like that. Sometimes guilt can drive us to extremes. Peter's temperament, he always used to act first and think later. Whatever the reasons were, Peter fell away. His zeal was foolish. We must be zealous, but we must be zealous for God's will, done in God's way. And finally, verses 51 and 52, John Mark. Ah, John Mark was a coward. I have a lot of sympathy for John Mark, because naturally I'm very timid. (laughs) You know? I think it would take quite a lot to get me to be willing to be burned at the stake. I'd probably die of a heart attack just thinking about it. John Mark struggled with fear, and he ran away. And um, maybe we are those who run. Maybe we run from commitment. Maybe we run away from costly service. Maybe we run away from challenges. But why did John Mark run? Well, we're told in verse 51 that he was a young man. Maybe it was just immaturity. He needed to grow up. But as we look at the story of John Mark, we find that he was timid by nature. He didn't only run away here. When Paul and Barnabas went on their missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, they took John Mark with them. And they got to a place called Pergia in Pamphylia. And do you know what John Mark did? He ran away again. And it was so bad that when Paul Paul and Barnabas were going to go on another missionary journey, Paul said, we can't take Mark with us. He's a coward. He runs away. Maybe it was his temperament. We need to be filled with the Spirit continually to have boldness. Well, uh, my time's gone. Let me just draw my conclusions very, very quickly. First of all, the reason these stories are told here, of them all falling away, is so that we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Christ, who didn't fall at all. More of that next week. Second thing I want to say is that falling away is not losing your salvation. Judas was never saved. Peter fell away. He didn't lose his salvation. Mark fell away. He didn't lose his salvation. They all fell away. They didn't lose our salvation. Our salvation doesn't depend upon what we do or don't do. 
Our salvation depends upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. Falling away is not losing your salvation. Thirdly, falling away does not disqualify you from serving Jesus Christ. The fact that there is sin in our lives, if that sin is repented of, and if we learn lessons from it, then in a strange way, that sin often qualifies us for service. It's often those who are the chief of sinners who become the greatest servants. So never think I'm disqualified because of the sin in my life. Sin will only disqualify you if it's not repented of. You see, the Apostle Paul says elders have got to be people who are blameless. But it's not that they've always been blameless through the whole of their lives. So their sin is forgiven and now they're living an upright and blameless life now. Falling away doesn't disqualify you from service, which is very fortunate, or else none of the 12 apostles would have been able to be apostles. And the final thing I want to say is that failure needn't be the last word. John Mark ran away, but that wasn't the end of it. Paul and Barnabas took him on a missionary journey. He ran away again. That wasn't the end of it. When the Apostle Paul was in prison, getting ready to be beheaded, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, his last words he ever wrote were, bring Mark, because he's been helpful to me in my ministry. Isn't that wonderful? He ran away, he ran away, but he was restored, and he was helpful to Paul, and it didn't end there, because he wrote this gospel, which is in the Bible, which has been helpful to millions of people down through the ages, and has helped me and helped you. You see, the shepherd was struck, the sheep were scattered, but the great shepherd grabs hold of his sheep and restores their souls. And so those of us who have fallen and fallen and fallen and fallen, you know what we do? We run back to the shepherd and stay near to him. And you know what? He will turn our weaknesses into strengths. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you that failure is not final because Jesus Christ didn't fail, because he was victorious. And thank you that he triumphs for us. And thank you that we share in his victory. That we are more than conquerors through him who strengthens us. And we can say with the Apostle Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong through Jesus Christ. But we also say with the Apostle Peter that when we think we are strong, when we think we can stand, we are weak. We pray that we might be those who are humble and stay close to the shepherd. We thank you for such a great shepherd. Amen.